Most of you know I completely geek out about all things that are personal development, empowerment, spirituality, healing our inner child, woo-woo, everything that helps us grow and evolve as a human being to have greater relationships and experience all the wonderful things that we want out of life. Well, my next guest is someone who completely jives with me. We are on the same level. We have the same philosophies. We've gone through the same healing path, and we had an absolutely impactful and powerful conversation. I now refer to her as my soul sister from the East Coast. Her name is Kim Kimball, and she is a certified life coach who helps ambitious women have thriving personal and professional relationships by healing codependency, enmeshment, and hyper-independence. Through a mind and body-based approach, she coaches women to understand the why behind their patterns of relating and return to a place of sovereignty, power, and authentic expression. Kim's work uses somatic and cognitive behavioral techniques to provide a holistic approach to healing. I invite you to grab something to write with and on so you can get the most out of this amazing conversation. You are listening to the Sweet Empowerment Podcast with Kristen Brown, where we upgrade our relationships and life by applying practical ideas, universal truths, and life-changing inspiration. Let's go have some fun. Welcome, Kim Kimball. I'm so excited to have you on the Sweet Empowerment Podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Kristen. It's great to be here. You know, you and I were talking just a little bit before I, we started recording about how when we connected with each other, we're like, boy, we're kind of in the same realm. And I just know this yeah. is going to be an amazing episode. And I'm just so happy to have you here. I know. I'm excited. I'm excited to dive in with somebody with, with such similar mindsets. Yeah, yeah. So Kim, can you tell us a little bit about your backstory that led you to the work you're doing today? Yeah, gosh, it's a long, it's a long one. I will try to convince it for, uh, condense it for folks. But essentially, um, I spent seven years getting doctorate level education. And I kept waiting to really, really be satisfied by the work that I was doing in the world. And I think that I had these ideas that when I like many people, right? Of when I reached X, Y, Z stage, then I would be happy. You know, mm-hmm. when I got married, then I would be happy. When I had kids, then I would be happy. When I reached X point in my career, then I would be happy. And I was dating someone at the time who I thought I was going to um, marry. And, and I just had in my mind that I was like almost at this finish line, right? Of the, then I would be happy moment. And I went on a trip to Thailand with this person and um, I thought I was going to come back engaged and I came back um, having been broken up with and never paid me back $2,000. So it was just this radical turn of events where I was really, really forced to reevaluate how do I actually create the life that I want to live in? that isn't dependent upon some external circumstance changing or another person, right? Mm. Um, and when that happened, I decided to quit my, quit my job and backpack around the world by myself and um, really have my own, I guess, eat, pray, love moment, you could say. Love that. And yeah, so I did that for four months and I just got really super clear without any of those external influences or pressures, you know, from friends, from family, from societal pressures, um, got super clear on like, what is it that I want? What do I value? What do I need? What do I want to be working towards? And I came up with a business idea while I was, um, while I was gone. And when I came back, I started working towards that. And Um, discovered life coaching. And it was this immediate shift where it felt like everything shifted into place. And I just knew that it was my purpose. I knew that it was what I was meant to be doing right now in my life. And so at that point, I enrolled in a certification program, a really intensive one, underwent the certification process, which was an arduous um, year-long process and started my coaching business. And all this was three years ago. So yeah, that's a little bit of the background journey of what led to um, now. That's 
Amazing. I'm really, I'm always impressed with the whole taking off by yourself and traveling the world thing, because that takes a lot of courage. It does. Yes. There's a lot of grit and courage needed in that. And I always tell people, people always say, oh my gosh, like, weren't you so nervous? Wasn't there? Um, Yes, of course. But also it felt more risky to me to not at that point. I feel Mm -hmm. like I had reached such a point where um, to stay felt like more of a risk than going. Oh, that's amazing. And I love that you had the self-awareness to feel your way through that and really be conscious about what was going to be best for you in that moment. Yeah, absolutely. Because a lot of people don't do that. You know, we we hear the call or the, the nudge and we just kind of push it away. Can you, can you talk about how, what that felt like for you and how you knew that to be true? Like maybe help people identify when those type of things come up for them, they can be like, well, this kind of feels like what Kim Kimball was talking about. Yeah. So, you know, at that point in my journey, I was still, um, and I'm sure you can relate with this to Kristen on some level, but at that point in my journey, I was still outsourcing a lot of things with other people more than I was really trusting my own internal wisdom and my own internal voice. So at that point in my life, it looked like getting a lot of counsel from people, you know, talking to a lot of people who are older and wiser than me, mm-hmm. telling them my circumstances, my situation, telling them my heart's desire, um, and really having them mirror back to me what I was, what they heard me saying, right? Um, and, and really kind of an arduous process of weighing the risks, weighing the possible benefits, weighing, you know, what direction my life could turn after making a decision like this. Um, you know, not necessarily like pros and cons lists, but really, really thinking through the pluses, the minuses, and all of the things involved and, and discussing that with lots and lots of people. But most of it really was this deep and I, I didn't have language for this now, that then like I yes. do now, but now I have language around so much of it was me tapping in and tuning into my own body sensations of really, it felt, it felt urgent, you know, it felt in my, in my system um, that there was just this deep resounding, no, not this, not any longer. We cannot take this any longer. And it felt like, like you were saying, like, yes, I could have squelched that down. And yes, I could have. Are we we talking about the, are we talking about the relationship or going around the world at this point? Going around the world. Yes. Yeah. Um, So I could have squelched that down, but it felt like it was getting increasingly loud. And I think people will somewhat resonate and know what I'm saying if they've been in a situation like that where I feel like there there comes a time and a level where um, your body and your mind and your heart actually starts to scream at you. It gets really, really loud. And the thing that I will say too is that after that, um, it can be kind of scary because if we avoid those screams for long enough, there will be silence. And that's almost a scarier place to be because it means we haven't listened for a really, really, really prolonged time, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So it was, for me, it was that mirroring um, done by other people, the really thinking everything through, and also the really learning to tap in and tune into my own body sensations and what they were, what they were telling me and what that meant, because, you know, we all have body sensations and if we learn to tune into those messages, they're giving us great messages on a daily mm-hmm. basis if we just choose to listen, you know? Oh, for sure. The body is just not here for us to walk around and feed. Yeah. It, it's so amazing when somebody really, when me or whoever really starts to pay attention, it's like, I'm getting signals and cues and feelings. And a lot of times people push away feelings because they just don't want to feel and they distract and they do other things in order not to feel when there's so much knowledge and information coming at us. If we would just be willing to open our hearts, right? Yeah. At all, at all times. And, and I feel like it's important to, 
acknowledge and recognize that so many of us weren't given the tools yes. to learn how to um, handle and allow emotions to run through us, to process emotions, to know what they mean, to know what um, signals they're trying to tell us, right? So there's no judgment, there's no shame in that. There's just an opportunity for growth. There's just an opportunity for learning. Um, and also to say, I always feel like I wanna bring up in these instances, a lot of us don't have the nervous system capacity to feel our Good feelings, point. Right? Good, great point. So we need to build this foundation mm. of nervous system capacity to feel our feelings and to even be able to access what those feelings are. So there is no shame or judgment around any of that. Um, yeah, just an opportunity for growth and continued curiosity and exploration. You know, that, you, wow, you have just touched on something that is so brilliant and so ooh, profound that we, a lot of people don't have the nervous systems. And especially, I feel like lately, just in life, I'm 53 and you know, it wasn't like this, it seems like when we were younger, but it feels like so much has happened that a lot of people are kind of on high alert right now. And, and they really, you're right. That's so beautiful. Thank you for, for adding that in. That's just amazing. Um, so I want to jump into the juicy, juicy, juicy stuff. Yeah, let's this, do it. Oh, I love this topic so much. I am a total nerd about this type of thing. And I think that's why I teach it too, is because once I started learning and healing, I was like, this is the best conversations ever because so much moves and shifts when we allow truth in and understanding what's going on because a lot of people don't even know how to get help because they don't know what's going on. And I know that one of the areas of expertise that you have is codependency, enmeshment, and in, in hyper-independence. Yeah. That's a juicy one too. So I would love if you would just give us a, like a definition of each or maybe examples, whatever you see fit. Yeah. So codependency is really this um, energy, if you would, of I'm okay if you're okay. If you're okay with me, then I'm okay. My, my being okay is dependent upon you being okay. That's sort of the way I think about codependency and the way that I think it can be really, really easy to understand. Um, I really like to say and mention that I personally feel and believe um, that codependency is really something that is in the water socioculturally for women. It's something that we are okay. taught. It's something that is applauded. It's something that is um, really, I, I would say like prized femininity and our culture is codependent by definition. So, mm -hmm. you know, when, when we're thinking about, uh, you know, the opposite of codependency to me, I think it's also really important to mention is sovereignty. So belonging to ourselves, knowing that I belong to me, that I, I am, I own myself, right? I have a, a, a defined sense of self, which is the exact opposite of what society and culture wants to tell women, which is to be selfless to have no self, right? Mm -hmm. That's what mm -hmm. society and culture wants of women. Um, so I just think it's really, really important to look at that sovereignty as sort of the, um, the counterpoint to the codependency. Mm -hmm. um, the enmeshment is, is really, you can sort of think about blending, you know? Who I am is just gonna blend into who you are. There's no real sense of, where I end and you begin, we are completely intertwined to the point where I can't see where I end and where you begin. This is really, really, really typical in relationships, especially with mothers and daughters. Um, it's really typical in households where, um, you know, there was a lack of boundaries when you were growing up. Enmeshment is super prevalent. You know, in all of these areas, I work with people absolutely in the areas of romantic relationships, but these dynamics and relationship dynamics show up across everywhere in all of your relationships, right? So relationships with your family, relationships with your friends, relationship with your boss and coworkers. Even if you're a coach, like 
like you and I are, it can be relationships with your clients are trigger, tr uh, triggering relationships with other mentors. You can have some of these same dynamics. So it crosses all relationships, not mm -hmm. just romantic relationships like people like to think of. And then the hyper independence, this is one that I can still hang out in sometimes <laughs> if I'm being completely honest. Um, and I see it as kind of like the counterpoint to codependency. It's this, it's this swing the other direction when we've realized that we have been codependent, we can sort of swing in the other direction and then go, I don't need anybody, you know? Um, I don't need anyone to be okay. I am my own island. Um, I, and, and then we tend to isolate ourselves and we can tend to have such firm boundaries that instead of having permeable boundaries, we end up having boundaries that are so firm that they're like a brick wall mm -hmm. and nobody can penetrate at all. And we end up very isolated and very alone. Um, and, and we stray far from the goal of, of that sovereignty and interdependence, right? Where mm -hmm. I am allowed to ask for and receive help because I'm a human and to be human is to need to be human is to um, be, be interdependent with other groups of humans and express our needs and be able to help each other to meet them, right? Mm -hmm. So that's sort of some brief definitions of all of those things that, like I say, I see super common just as means of, of living in the society and the culture and the days and the times that we do um, and, and really super common and prevalent with women especially. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I'm hoping that there's a shift in that. I mean, I look back on my mother and how she was beautiful woman for, you know, inside and out, just a lovely human being, but her inability to have sovereignty in her relationship with my dad, you know, and it wasn't just because of him, it was just in general, what was imposed upon her. And I could see this woman, my whole life trying to bust out of this bubble but not having the tools or even the mentors out there at that time. And I feel like um, this is a, such a special time, I feel like in history for us and for our children and successors and theirs and theirs, because I'm seeing this trickle down into the youth right now, this, because they're, they're getting information that we really didn't have, you know, or at least when we were younger, I know it's around now. So, um, you talked about the pendulum and I think that's so important because I see that a lot and I use that same analogy, shocking. That when somebody tries to make a shift in their life from just the level of brain, from the level of just thinking, I often say when that pendulum drops, it goes all the way over to the other side where we're going to do the opposite because you think of a pendulum, that's exactly what it does. And reaction. It's very reactionary. Yeah. Yes. And then, but what we're looking for is where it hovers kind of around the middle. And that's what I noticed with my own healing work is that, that, you know, as long as I'm somewhere in this area and for the podcast people, I'm kind of waving my hand in this, in the center of what a big pendulum, a big smile pendulum would be just kind of down near the bottom of it. When I'm hovering there, I know I'm in the right place. I'm not kind of going way to the one side or way to the other side. And I think that's an amazing point that you brought up. You did mention, and I thought, well, that's interesting how mothers and daughters can tend to be more codependent. Is it codependent or enmeshed? I think you said enmeshed. Enmeshed, yes. Tell yes. us about that. Yeah, so that really comes from the patriarchal programming and society that we're in. And so I, I, I really loved what you were talking about of, of seeing your mother trying to break out of these boxes, right? And And... I agree with you that we are living in sort of a, a very different time now and it feels like consciousness continues to raise in these areas specifically, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's very much because, and, and I'll just use this example of mothers and daughters and, and people in our generation, you know, mothers are still very much in this patriarchal programming that they couldn't break out of, likely had no consciousness and awareness around. And those things get passed down to the daughters 
because we learn how to be a woman in the world based on how we see our mothers being a woman in the world. Mm -hmm. And our mothers gave away their power. Um, you know, they, they said, you know, my worth and my value is based on how I caretake other people, how well I can carry the emotional burden and load for others, be the emotional caretaker, how much I overgive, how, how selfless I am, right? All of these things. Mm -hmm. um, and then us as daughters end up taking those things on. And it's almost like when we try to do things to that breaks out of that box, it almost feels like this very, um, an affront to the mother that has given away everything, right? Brilliant. It feels like, how dare you surpass me? All of this is subconscious. Mm -hmm. And it creates this conflict of, oh, I, I know subconsciously that I can't surpass my mother in the amount of power that she had and the amount um, that she was able to stand in her own power, have her own sovereignty. I can't do that because my mother is going to be upset with me because she wasn't able to do that. And it's very confronting if I do that and she couldn't, right? And again, all of this is very subconscious dynamics, but it leads to a lot of enmeshment of I will keep myself small to keep my mother comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and I really do see this as a lot of the source of, you know, I don't know if you've noticed this, Kristen, but there is, a, there is just an epidemic of very difficult mother-daughter relationships. Mm -hmm. um, a lot. Yes, a lot, a lot. And so I feel like a lot of this unspoken dynamic is what goes on underneath that makes a lot of difficulty with mother-daughter relationships. Mm, you are wearing your brilliance, girl. That, <laughs> that, is, that is beautiful. It, it really, really, really is. And I'm, I couldn't help but put myself into that position when you were saying that because my mom was people pleaser extraordinaire. Um, and, and I could tell at times when she was like, sh 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 like trying to shut me down, you know, no, no, don't, you know, don't say that. Don't, don't do that. But here I am being raised in a household full of boys. I had four brothers and I was the only mm -hmm. girl. And it's like, I had to fight for my place just within the family. And so while you're saying this, I'm like, wow, I had that influence, but I also had the influence of in, in the positive way of her letting me be me. So it was very interesting that, you know, as you're saying that I'm processing through that and that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I want to just circle back just a little bit back to when we were first giving definitions about codependency and meshment and hyper independence. So yeah. that's a mouthful. <laughs> what is the fallout? Why is it that we want to heal these things? Like how is this showing up in our relationships that's hurting us? Yeah, beautiful question. I love that. Because I think so many times these things, um, we're not conscious of them. And so many times we just feel a lack, a general lack of satisfaction in our relationships, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so maybe let's even start there. Like if you feel a general lack of satisfaction, a general lack of, um, like my relationships don't fill me up, that could be one sign and mm -hmm. one symptom, right? But to get more specific on each of these things, I just kind of wanted to start at the general umbrella of if you are feeling that, it can potentially be from, from any of these things. But mm -hmm. with codependency, a lot of times what I see is that people will feel anxious in their relationships, a, a really big underlying source of anxiety of, um, a lot of mind reading that needs to happen, right? I need to pick up on these subtle cues mm. and things that are never like expressly communicated to me. I'm responsible for knowing them so that I can meet those needs. Even though I, I've never had those needs communicated to me. And if, if I if somehow fail at that, then I'm a failure and I am not good in this relationship and I feel bad and wrong, right? And so there's this constant underlying anxiety of I need to be perfect in the way that I present myself and I need to be exactly who you want me to be and need me to be at all times in order to care for you. Um, a feeling of needing to care for your emotional burdens, um, a, a feeling of needing to fix and save are huge, huge, huge points. 
Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I need to fix you. I need to save you from yourself. I need to save you from your emotions. I need to save you from the consequences of your actions. Um, all of those things are huge things and themes that I see in codependency. Um, Mm -hmm. and again, just the way that you appear and being whoever and whatever others need you to be keeping yourself small, not rocking the boat. Um, you know, only saying what, what is going to be palatable and accepted by other people. I could go on and on and on as I know you could as well, Kristen. No, this is so good. Keep going. So, I, yeah. keep, I want people to be listening. It's going, oh my God, that's me. I want them to have that epiphany, that awakening. Because when I did my healing work, I didn't have terms. I yeah. just worked on myself. And then in the, in the, in the, backwards I was like I think it was a little bit of that or a little bit of that I didn't really know where I needed to head I just started heading (laughs) yep yeah so all of those things um are huge like ding 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 signals Mm. that potentially some codependency is going on underneath there um enmeshment really feeling like and I mean there's some overlap in some of these things but really Mm. feeling like responsible for the other person's emotions responsible for the other person's actions and feeling like you need to take that on yourself is really the the main primary thing of enmeshment um for i'll I'll give you it can help to have a little bit of example so i'll give you an example with this one that i think about um let's say for example my husband comes home from work and he's had a really hard day when he comes home and he brings that energy home, if there's some enmeshment going on, I, I now feel that energy. I now am having a bad day mm-hmm. because he is having a bad day. So there's no separation there, right? If, if whatever his energy is, my energy then becomes because I don't know where he ends and where I begin versus if you've got that sovereignty and, and interdependence, I'm so sorry you have had a hard day. How can I help you? But I am staying in my energy yeah. of I had a good day. And just because you had a bad day doesn't mean I had a bad day, right? I and still so, relate to this. This was, yeah, this was something I did for sure. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I think so many, you know, myself included, I'm raising my hand here too. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not sitting here from a perch um, no. talk, talking from above by any stretch of the imagination. So Um, That's just an example of enmeshment. And then the hyper-independence, that is, and again, I can tend to hang out in this space a lot and and I catch myself here sometimes as well. Um, And this can tend to be people and folks who have been really hurt by relationships. So I wanna say that and I wanna honor that, right? Of Mm -hmm. I've been really hurt by relationships. So I'm gonna put up a lot of walls and I'm gonna put up, Uh, this armor where nobody can really reach me and therefore I'm not going to be hurt by relationships again, but it looks like an inability to receive help, an inability to receive love, not wanting to ask for help, not desiring to express our needs because we feel like it makes us look weak or undesirable or like too much or either not enough, which is really Mm -hmm. the same thing, too much, you know? Um, So it's, like I said, it's this, this feeling of, I need to be on an Island. And if I'm on an Island enough, then it means I won't have conflict with other people. Other people will like me more because I'm not being a burden and I'm not, um, having to, you know, get help or express my needs. Um, it, it, we think inadvertently, obviously that, that being in this hyper independent place makes us more desirable for other people in relationships because it makes us feel like we're less of a burden and therefore others will want to be around us more. But really what it's doing is it's locking other people out and it's not allowing other people the opportunity to get to know who we really are Mm -hmm. and to connect with us and to relate with us on an, on, on an authentic and real level. Yeah. And you know, you said the magic word burden. So many people don't want to be a burden. They don't like, oh, no, no, no. I can't talk about my issues. You got, well, you got your stuff going on. I'm like, I don't got anything going on. Bring your issues. You know what I mean? It's like, I got space for you, but I also know that person tends to, I'm saying that person in in a plural way. Yeah. Because I've dealt with this many times in my life. We're like, oh, no, no, no. I'm like, bring it. I'm here for you. I, and I always tell people, I geek out on this stuff. I love it. Talk to me. I'm your guy. I love people. I want to know. I want to help, you know, but, um, 
what you're saying, I often call all of this, and I'm just going to blanket over all three terms is I call it sacrificing your sacred self yeah. for, for all these other reasons that have nothing to do with you. And when you were ex going into examples about the codependency, I was thinking, you know, that's, I wonder if there's, you were talking about it turning into anxiety, but I wonder, and I'm not sure the word to use that deep inside the person knows and feels that their own needs are not getting met and, and it's causing some kind of upheaval in them, but they don't even really know what's happening because they don't even believe that they're allowed to have some needs. Yeah, exactly. I mean, to share a little bit, I, I think all of those points are amazing and thank you for bringing them up. Um, to give a little illustration in my own life. So my sister was an addict and alcoholic from the time that I was nine. And so there didn't have to be any um, external like voiced, somebody voiced saying you're not allowed to have needs. I learned that by my environment of there was so much chaos, there was so much going on that my internal feeling was that if I had a need, it was going to be the straw that broke the camel's back and it was gonna you know, disintegrate our family because we were already dealing with so much, right? And so, so many times people may have this sense of underlying anxiety, um, but they may not even know that it, it is linked yes. back to not having needs because they've never been allowed to have needs, mm -hmm. right? I was never allowed to feel like I had any needs. And so learning about that can be so freeing. Even, even first step to any of this can be learning how to identify your needs because if you've spent a lifetime of attempting not to have any and and shutting it out even to your own conscious awareness mm -hmm. that can be a huge first step yeah yeah that really is what what are your thoughts on not being protected in your youth meaning that you you know even if you had the most well meaning parents but they didn't really protect you. I feel like we go forward and don't even know how to protect ourselves because again, and this is a lot of times this is innocent. Like they don't know they're doing this. Our parents, a lot of what our parents do is innocent. They're just doing the best they can in any given moment. But I've seen parents that love their kids fiercely, but just didn't know how to protect them. And then the child goes forward and doesn't know how to protect themselves. Do you have any thoughts on that? My thoughts are exactly what you just said it is, and I mean, that's my own personal experience. It's, it's an experience that I see mirrored over and over again in my clients. Mm -hmm. um, just like you were saying, when, when we don't, and, and I, I, it's really important what you said as well of 99% of, of the time, this wasn't malicious in mm -hmm. origin, right? It was I, I believe wholeheartedly that every single parent is doing the best that they can mm -hmm. and the best that they know how to do with the tools that they have and the wisdom and the knowledge that they have at the time, right? Um, but even for, for myself, for my own parents, like I wasn't, I was not protected. There were so many boundaries that would have saved me from mm -hmm. um, a lot of the chaos that was me happening, too. right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then that is what is mirrored. That is what is modeled to us. We internalize this, um, narrative of, well, I must not be worthy of protecting. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I, I and it's just never modeled of how to set boundaries. And, and again, where I end and where you begin and all of these other things. Um, and so it's really, really, really hard when that hasn't been modeled and where, where you have never learned how to do that. And so there is absolutely no shame in it. Mm -hmm. um, it is completely normal that when you, as you said, you fail to be protected as a young one. And that's when remothering and reparenting mm -hmm. ourselves comes in, right? Of, of learning how to give ourselves the things that we were not given. Mm -hmm. Because we, we have to learn how to do that for ourselves now. And it's, and it's a, it's a growing and stretching experience. It's not easy. It doesn't come naturally. It's something that is a learned skill that we have to practice and we have to practice it over and over and over again. But do, did you, I had the experience of once I started practicing it, the way I felt 
and the way that the world in general was responding to it. Granted, there are some people that did not or like that, but it, I felt so much lighter and freer and like I had stepped into a pair of shoes I, you know, that I had never been in before and it felt so good. And I, I always tell people I'm like this, it, the work, it appears scary. It appears like this big monster in the bush, but when you start doing it, the monster that you're afraid of is really just a little bunny. There's, it's, it's not as scary as people think it is to go there, in my opinion. Um, you also talked on shame and I wrote that down earlier and I'm so glad you brought that back up again because I think a lot of people don't do the work because they are so incredibly ashamed of whatever story or they're afraid of talking bad about a parent or a family member because yes. they love them. So can you share with some about that? Yeah, I think it's really, really important to recognize that I think in our culture and our society in general, we tend to be very black and white and we tend to be very either or instead of being able to really hold nuance and hold the tension of both and. And so being able to hold that tension of my parent did the absolute best that they could and was an awesome parent in so many ways. And yet there are these wounds and things that happen to me. And those things are also real and valid. And one doesn't negate the other. One doesn't mean that the other isn't true, right? 100%, 100%. And, and so I see people really feeling like, well, if I admit that there were these things that my parent did that inadvertently caused harm, that in inadvertently has given me difficult patterns of relating in my adulthood, that means that I'm bashing my parent. Mm -hmm. That means that I am talking down on them and I'm cutting them down and, and they gave me everything, right? And they were at all my soccer games and they were part of the PTA and da, 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 right? Um, it doesn't mean that. It means that you are taking self-responsibility mm. so that you then are not carrying that forward into your life, into your patterns of relating, passing it down to your children and to the next generation and so on and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that our, um, our inability to hold that nuance is really what, and, and, and making things more either or instead of both and is really what, what brings up that difficulty. And then the shame piece, you know, shame is really this feeling of not I did something wrong, but I am wrong. That's the difference between guilt and shame, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, that shame that we carry with us is I am wrong, I am bad. Um, and I find that shame really is most prevalent and common because in our, in our younger years, we don't have the cognitive ability to be able to say, oh, like let's say, well, I'll, it's easiest to use examples of myself. Let's say my, my parents were not able to be there for me emotionally because of what was going on in my household. Mm -hmm. I internalize that as I am too much for them, right? Instead of they have a lot going on and they don't have the capacity to be there for me. Mm -hmm. So that's how shame gets internalized is that as a young child, we don't have that cognitive ability. We literally don't have that brain development yet mm -hmm. to be able to differentiate and to be able to say, this is something that is going on with my parent and it has nothing to do with me. So we then internalized, I am bad, I am wrong. When in fact it had absolutely nothing to do with you and everything to do with the circumstances of your parents. A hundred percent. I see that a lot. I can completely relate. I'm thinking of someone right now whose father was an alcoholic and that person thought they were responsible for the parents' alcoholism. Mm -hmm. And I encouraged that person to go, I said, go ask, go ask dad, because they have a he's father's clean and sober now. And the dad said, Oh no. He said, that was that was um shyness. That was my way of getting over shyness that just went amok. Mm -hmm. You know, so the this this poor adult child's walking around thinking it was his fault and it wasn't. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. it, it, this is such, 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 such important and juicy work. And you said the magic words here at the Sweet Empowerment Podcast, which is taking responsibility. Yeah. I, I, I repeat that. I also repeat awareness is key. 
which is why I love these interviews and conversations with people like you, because we're bringing awareness to the world, because I feel so many people don't want to be where they're at, but they don't know how to get, they don't know what to do. They don't even, they're like lost. So I feel like this podcast provides that platform for people to kind of um, investigate and look around and, and maybe solve some of the mystery that's happening. But the taking responsibility piece, I would like, I would love if you shared a definition about that, because I think it can be that people are like, well, how can I take responsibility for um, my mother was a this and a that and, and she did this to me. So how can I take responsibility? So can you share your amazingness on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, before I get into a definition, so to speak, I, I, I like to really highlight and point out that when we are codependent, we are really lacking in self-responsibility and yet we are controlling and trying to get other people to take responsibility. Yes. So it's really very, very, very inverted. Yes. Um, so what we are trying to do is to learn to take self-responsibility, as I mentioned in these instances. So let's say that there's an instance with your mom, like you're talking about, and well, well, she's the one behaving this way, da da da, da. Taking self-responsibility isn't taking responsibility for her behaviors, mm -hmm. but it's taking responsibility and saying, okay, what do my boundaries need to be? How can I take responsibility for my boundaries? And how can I take responsibility for how potentially my behavior, my actions, my thoughts are potentially impacting our relationship dynamics, right? Because there are two people in a relationship always. And mm -hmm. when we choose to take responsibility for ourselves, that is always going to shift the relationship dynamic. Always. Mm -hmm. so, Absolutely. So yeah, it's not, it's not saying, oh, well, I'm responsible for the way my mom acted in that situation. It's saying, how am I going to be responsible for my thoughts, my feelings, my boundaries, what my response is going to be, or my non-response, or mm -hmm. my taking myself away, um, taking responsibility for all of those things, taking responsibility for how I act in the future, really looking at, oh, this relationship dynamic that I have with my mom, how is that potentially playing out in other relationships in my life? Mm -hmm. Is that impacting other relationships in my life? Um, have I taken on, like, let's say mom behaves in XYZ way, and then my reaction is to stay silent and make myself small and never voice my needs. Am I doing that anywhere else? And am I taking responsibility for, oh, I realize that pattern and that's not something that I really want. So next time mom acts that way, I'm going to actually speak up in a loving and kind way. I'm going to take responsibility for the way I'm bringing it up, that I'm not projecting, I'm not blaming, I'm not um, exploding my anger or, or my emotions on someone else, all of those things. I feel like I could go on and on and on, but. I agree. I know exactly what you're talking about. And this is something that I love about this whole thing and that that I learned on my journey was that when I started taking full responsibility, I call it radical responsibility at all moments, at all moments, even if, even if a clerk is being nasty to me in a store, I'm like, what energy did I bring to this? What thoughts have I had today? How have I, you know, contributed? And if, you know, if I did, I did, if I didn't, I didn't, that's part of the whole process. But I found that when I started taking responsibility for my life, like completely in my relationships, it actually became fun because I didn't, I have zero control over what anybody else is doing, but I can control me yes. and I can have, a, I can choose something different that just might change the equation enough that I'm going to have a different outcome. And what I have experienced is that I do get different outcomes. And so it really kept that train rolling. And I got really excited. Like if something happens, the first thing I do is hmm, what, what's my piece in this? Instead of saying, oh gosh, so-and-so's in a mood or so-and-so's this, or I'm like, hmm. Now, sometimes it is, of course, just other people being, being who they are. Yeah. But again, if, you know, we can either choose to accept, okay, well, it's just how they are in this moment, or we may need to set a boundary or something. I would oh my gosh, we're running out of time. So I just want to jump forward real quick and hear your unique perspective about self-sabotage. 
Ooh. Yeah. My, my unique perspective on self-sabotage, and this of course relates to patterns of relating as well, but all areas of self-sabotage, um, is that it comes from a lack of internal safety. Mm. So what I mean by that, I'm going to give you sort of a, a benign example. What I hear from people a lot is like, I can't stop procrastinating. Like mm -hmm. I have this thing that I really want to do. And yet when I sit down to do it, I'm going to check my phone. I'm going to answer some emails that are not even important. I'm going to call a girlfriend. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do anything but this. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then these internal narratives of I'm so lazy, I'm weak. I lack discipline, you know, all of these things that are potentially we internalize that are wrong with ourselves. Right. Um, because we can't make ourselves do the thing that deep down we know we really want to do. And in patterns of relating, this may look like I always choose the man that I know is not good for me and that is emotionally unavailable and is distant. Or when somebody pulls close to me, I pull away immediately, even though I know this is potentially a really good thing for me, right? So you're getting the drift, all of these patterns of self-sabotage. Mm -hmm. Really, it's because we do not feel, it's not because we're lazy or we lack discipline or we don't want connection or any of these other things. Nothing is wrong with you. It just means that there is a lack of internal safety, a lack of nervous system capacity for you to actually feel safe and proceeding forward. And we can try to shift our mindset all day long. We can tell ourselves what we feel is true about the situation, but until we feel safe on a body level, on a physical level, until we build up our nervous system capacity to be with that thing without it sending us into fight, flies, fight flight, or freeze responses, it will not feel safe for us to go forward. And therefore we will self-sabotage, right? It's actually so wise and so kind of you to do that for yourself, right? When you don't feel that it's safe to proceed forward. Mm -hmm. So I think we spend so much time and energy and effort um, trying to change these like really surface level behaviors and manifestations of things when if we really got down to it and realized, oh, I'm not feeling safe and I just need to work on a somatic level, on a body-based level, on working on my nervous system capacity to be with this thing without it sending me into fight, flight, or freeze responses, then we could move forward with ease, right? It wouldn't be us fighting against ourselves anymore. So, so would you say that's the first step, Kim, is for people to Absolutely. work on yes. the, the nervous system first? Yes. That's yes. so interesting. It's so interesting because that's what I organically did during my healing thing 12 years ago. The very first thing I did was drop to the ground. I started meditating every day, every day and as much in, as I could. And I, and that it, it's absolutely hundred percent true what you're saying that that allowed, that created so much space in me Thanks. unknowingly. I just, at that time, I just needed to stop my pounding heart. That's why I had a huge story. You know, a little bit about it, but I had just like, I can't breathe. I can't eat. You know, my mouth is cardboard. I've lost weight. I have got to stop this. So I, I hit the ground and that's what I did. I started meditating, but what came from it was this space in my life, which I didn't know. I, I was happy if my heart stopped pounding. I was like, Oh good. My heart stopped pounding. But all of a sudden the, the, uh, what's the word I want to look for? The, um, what came afterwards was this incredible space that I was able to see clearly and feel clearly. So I just love that you're bringing that to the equation that the very first step would be to, to calm that little nervous system. The poor thing is on overdrive. That's right. You know? That is the first step. And I find that when we do things in the proper order like that, it makes everything so much more easeful. Yeah, it really, really, really does. I, uh, we're almost out of time, but I want to ask you this question because this is so important and so many people run up against this. And that is, what is the best way to have a hard conversation with someone when you have to set a boundary or you have to point out somebody's ish or, you know, whatever it might be. It's, those are scary for people. Yeah, it's scary. And I want to validate that it's scary and it's normal and okay for it to be scary. Um, I, I like to tell my clients and people that I work with that a, a couple of things. 
first of all, really consider um, who do you want to be when you are about to have this conversation? And what do you need to do in order to get into that energy of who you want to be, right? Mm -hmm. so, so if you say to yourself, like, I want to be kind, I want to be, um, I want to listen, I want to be empathetic, I want to be curious and open to hearing their point of view. And you're like, okay, am I able to do that right now? Um, no, my nervous system is on complete overdrive. Well, what do I need to do in order to get myself into a space where I can be those things, right? And that, that is going to be different for everybody. So, you know, for you, maybe, Kristen, it was med meditation. Um, for somebody else, maybe it's, I need to go for a run and, mm -hmm. and really expel yeah. that energy. For somebody else, maybe it's, I need to do yoga or I need to talk to a friend or I need to talk to a therapist. I need to talk to my coach, whatever it may be, right? Process. Get in nature, you know, yes. whatever it is for whoever, right? Whatever it is for you, it is unique to each individual. So um, really getting into that proper energy for you. I, I feel like, and this is, this is me, and I know this has been helpful to so many people that I work with. It is so helpful to me to really um, write down or talk out into a voice memo app. Like what things, what are the, what are not, not that you have to go into every detail of everything that you're gonna say and have a script, but what are the high points of what you wanna make sure and get across? And really having that in mind so that it can be kind of the, um, you can have the bones, the skeleton, if you would, of the conversation in your mind so that you um, sort of have an idea of where you wanna go with it, right? Um, because you don't wanna be, like leaving the conversation and then being like, man, like I had all this stuff that I wanted to say. We hear that a I lot, didn't, don't we? I, I wasn't able to get to it, you know? Um, I totally spaced on what it was. So I like to kind of have that written down, um, have some general thoughts and ideas of what you want to say. Um, and then I also really, really, really like to say and talk about, um, really make sure that you have process through your own emotions before you get into this conversation so that you're not going into the conversation blaming or projecting or um you know going into it just listing the other person's faults and the things that the other person did right that's not the point mm -hmm. of having a difficult conversation that's not the point mm -hmm. at all so make sure and take time on the front end to really process through your own emotions, allowing those emotions to run through you and express in a healthy way so that you're not projecting them all over onto another person. Um, and then just being able to really have that conversation when you do have that conversation. And I know this can seem trite and I know people have probably heard this, but I think that it is trite for a reason and it's because it actually works when you're having the conversation, make sure you have it from a place of I feel statements, mm -hmm. you know, always centered and focused around you and what your experience was. You are inside yourself. You are the master of you. You are the one that knows your own internal experience and you're sharing it with the other person so that they can understand and so that they can relate. And, and you want to likewise hear what their experience was, which no doubt is different than your own because they're coming at it from a different lens. You know, 100%. we all have our own internal experience. We're bringing all of our lifetime of experience with us to each conversation. And we have the glasses on of all of our lifetime of experience that we're viewing things through, right? So being able to respect that and being able to say, you know, when X, Y, Z happened, this is how it made me feel. You know, are you open to discussing that more, you know? when you do this, this triggers this in me. And I know that it's from my childhood. Would you be willing to discuss ways of potentially us working together so that that doesn't, you know, trigger me so much and taking responsibility for your own triggers, but can we find a way to work through this together? Right. Um, and the really tricky thing is making sure that when you're doing these, I feel statements to not come from a place of judgment within it. Right. Of like, well, when you do this, you know, there can be an air of judgment. There can be an air of, you know, my way is better than your way. And you just need to do things. We're not doing that. We're just taking within us, you know, my, I feel statements and I am coming at it from a, a an angle of curiosity, of openness, of non-judgment, of, I am truly trying to relate with you 
and understand your perspective and help you to understand mine. Mm -hmm. So, oh, beautiful. One last question. Yeah. This is last question to point out. Um, <laughs> what if, because this comes up, a person is dealing with someone who's, who's difficult, like who's not willing to sit down and have a rational conversation. If they're dealing with someone who blows or freaks out or gaslights or manipulates or gets all crazy, what would you suggest to someone dealing with someone like that? Yeah. Um, first of all, it happens and so much empathy and compassion. Um, I feel like these things can be extremely difficult. The situations that you're talking about, they can be extremely difficult when they're in relationships that are um, our, our nearest and our dearest relationships, right? So um, what I'm thinking of is like with our parents, with our siblings, with our immediate family members, um, with our spouses, these things are particularly difficult in these situations, especially because in those relationships, you really think of them as more permanent relationships, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You're not, you can't just be like, oh, well, I'm just not going to talk to that person anymore, right? That, that makes these things very, very, very difficult. Um, and what I will say is that, you know, it is completely unique individual, individual to each person. It's very difficult for me to say a blanket statement on this because it is very, very individual for each person. What I will say is in these instances, um, I'm thinking of personal examples for me. Like if somebody, if a family member comes at me with gaslighting, once you get to a really safe and secure place within you, it can be as simple as, um, I understand what you're saying, but that's not my experience. And leaving Man. it at that. Amen. And, and having it, you know, you don't need to get in an argument. You don't need to get in a back and forth. There doesn't need to be this escalation that happens. It can be something so simple as I'm standing by and I'm sticking to, this is my experience. And, and nobody can argue with your experience, right? Absolutely. It is within me. It is my experience. Um, other situations, you know, if there, if there's a huff, if they're walking off, it can be um, something as simple as, you know, I, I don't appreciate being talked to that way. And I will remove myself from this situation if, and when, um, an escalation in tone or X, Y, Z happens and, and I'm not feeling good about this conversation anymore. Right. So it's 100%, can be yes. putting a boundary in that situation. And then the difficulty with that is, is really sticking to that. Right not wobbling and saying, oh, I told them that I was going to do that, but now I'm in, I'm in this situation and I'm going to wobble on that and I'm just going to let it slide, right? Once you say that, it's really enforcing that is going to create a new pattern and a mm -hmm. new dynamic where that isn't tolerated. So it's not boundaries in these situations, I think it's important to say, is not to control the other person. That's not what a boundary is ever about. It's about saying what I will do to control me and to protect myself in those situations. Mm -hmm. So again, you noticed that I said, I will remove myself from this yes. situation. If you're talking to me this way, it's not saying you can't talk to me this way mm -hmm. or, or get talking, out, yeah. right? It's saying, if you talk to me this way, this will be my response. Mm -hmm. um, and so really it can be some combination of standing your ground, boundaries taking place. And unfortunately, you know, I hate to say this and everybody, again, everybody has different timeline on this. Mm -hmm. It can be, you know, I choose not to have uh, uh, the same depth of relationship with this family member anymore. Mm -hmm. I choose to not um, be around this family member when there's not other people around or I choose to only see this family member X, Y, Z amount of times a year or something of that nature. Um, you get to choose the, the level and the depth of relationship that you have. And, and that may be, you know, I always tell people, you know, relationship dynamics, when you are changing you and it's shifting the relationship dynamic, it can take a while for things to sort of settle, you know? 
Um, and giving grace and space for that to the, to the amount and ability that feels comfortable for you to do so. Mm -hmm. And then if you're like, man, I've given this some time and this is just still really rocky, being able to make a choice and a decision from that point forward, that feels good to you. I agree with that. It's not always one and done. It's no. just not one and done because these people are used to functioning in a certain pattern with us. And when we interrupt that pattern and do something different, they're, you know, probably unconsciously a little shocked. They don't really know how to handle that. And it depends where they're at emotionally health-wise, whether they try to find another manipulation strategy or they go, hmm, yeah, that makes sense. And they start to conform, for lack of a better word, to the new status quo. It, it takes a minute, but I love and, that you- And they, they actually will try unconsciously to get back to that old relationship dynamic because it feels safe. Yeah. So them, you know, getting, ah, and like trying to find these new manipulation strategies is them unconsciously trying to reinstate the old relationship dynamic. That makes so much sense because it's comfortable and it's what yeah. they know. And the unknown is often scary to human beings. You know, we're often scared of the unknown. So, and a lot of this is so unconscious. Like if you're dealing with someone yeah. that's doing this and they're trying to get back to that space, I don't think they're sitting in bed at night, writing notes about how they're going to manipulate you to get you back into that argumentative space. It's just exactly. their, it's, yeah. it's their body, their automatic way of doing things until it becomes not the automatic way of doing things. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Well, Kim, amazing, amazing, amazing conversation. We are soul sisters, girl. Yes, we are. Thank oh my goodness. This was so fun. My girlfriend on the, on the East coast. Yes. So how can people connect with you? Like give us all your goodies. Where are you at? What platforms? What's your website? Yes. My website is www.kimkimballcoaching.com and you spell my last name k-i-m-b-a-l-l -L. i am on instagram most often again at the same handle kim kimball coaching um, and i would love to connect with you stop by drop me a dm i'm happy to chat with you anytime um yeah that's amazing thank you so much for being here i really really appreciate you this was an amazing amazing conversation thank you so much for having me kristen i appreciate it I hope you all enjoyed this interview as much as I did. And if you did, I would sure appreciate it if you jumped over to iTunes and left me a five-star rating and review. And don't forget to share it with someone that you love. Until next time, everyone, remember, you matter.